Amen. Amen. Well, I bring you greetings from Kigezi, from Rakai, from Rushere, in Yabushozi. I was away for about eight or nine days. I, I miss this church. It's very strange. You might be preaching in a different church, but your mind is in Makeda for God's church. It's a, it's, a, it's a funny feeling. You are somewhere, but your heart is still here. But anyway, we had a wonderful uh, ministry there. And uh, we want to bring you greetings from your brethren in those different parts of the country. Um, the church is growing strong, and they send their love to you. Do you receive them? You receive them. Yeah. They love you. They love you, and they hosted us very well. Um, I'm going to be doing those trips, uh, you know, uh, throughout the year, so you need to get used to it. I, um, I do want to continue, of course, ministering a couple of times every month, but a few times I'll be traveling to minister in other parts of this country. In fact, next month or the other month, I'll be traveling to Kenya uh, for two weeks of ministry. So you, you keep on praying for us. And as usual, I travel with my babe. So she's, she's, uh, she's always by my side and uh, we'll be traveling together. This morning, I want us to continue the theme on families. I thank God that Pastor maybe the Lord used them so powerfully, and I truly thank God for that. And Pastor Dan, the, the Sunday before, and this morning I want us to continue on the same theme. Those who did not, who don't know this, we decided to uh, prayerfully come up with a series of messages that are derived from our core values. Uh, you remember last time was we, we, we showed you the core values of the church. And throughout the year, we shall be hitting and emphasizing uh, uh, one by one so that these, these values mean something to you. They're not just things we put on paper, but they mean something to you. And these um, few weeks, we are looking at the value of families, bible studied families. And this morning... I want to speak on the theme or topic, inviting, hosting, and containing the presence of God in our homes. Inviting, hosting, and containing the presence of God in our homes. And for our text, I want us to read uh, the book of uh, 2 Samuel, uh, chapter 6, and... Um, Oh, I wish I could read the whole chapter, but it's too long. Um, let's read from verse 3. It's the word of God. We've come to church. Verse 3. Second Samuel, chapter 6, verse 3. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart and they brought it out of the house of Abinadab which was at Gibeah accompanying the ark of God and Ahio went before the ark let me just pause here for a few more minutes you probably know that the ark spent 20 years um, neglected abandoned in this man's home Abinadab was a priest his sons, uh, Uzziah and Ahio, are there for priests. And uh, they were the ones who were the custodians of the ark uh, when the Philistines brought it and dumped it in Israel. And for 20 years, uh, the ark was more or less ignored and, you know, no one cared about it. Um, but then David had an inspiration to bring the ark and place it in the city of Jerusalem, at the heart of the nation. And uh, the two sons of Abinadab were the ones who were given the task 
of driving the cart or the wagon carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Um, but they had grown up with this Ark in their home. So, and we'll talk about that. In verse 5, And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fire wood, even on harps and on salteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. When they came to Nachon threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, in particular Uzzah. And God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. Now, let me just pause there again because I think this is significant. How does an oxen that normally carries load and is used to carrying heavy loads sleep on a threshing, threshing floor? Because normally threshing floors are flat. There are no potholes. It is, they use that, the, the soil is compacted. It is hard, it's flat, it's a threshing floor. You know, people use it to thrash and separate grain from, from, from chaff. So it is hard floor. So it appears. Oh. God had a point to make that at that particular moment, not very far from the house of Obed Edom, is where this young man died. Now, I have no proof, but, you know, God gives us imagination, and we can think and imagine. I imagine this young man had grown up with the Ark of the Covenant in his home, and he had got used to it. You know, familiarity breeds what? Contempt. When you're familiar with somebody, you can begin to take him for granted. It's possible Uzzah and his brother had grown up with this box and it was no longer a big thing to them and probably he had already offended God. It's possible he had been disrespectful about the presence of God. The Ark of the Covenant represented God's presence and glory in Israel. It stood for his presence. It symbolized, it represented God's presence among his people. So the way you, 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 you responded and handled the Ark of the Covenant reflected how much you respected God. So I suspect this man died not just because he touched the Ark of the Covenant, but there was record. There were incidents. There were cases even before that. Because he grew up with this ark and he had become, you know, I'm a priest. This is something I've grown up with. No big deal. The presence of God must be respected. The presence of God must be valued. It must be dignified in our lives. It must, it must be given due respect and honor. The presence of God is, is invaluable. And we must be careful how we behave in the presence of God. Now, let's continue. It says, in verse 8, And David was displeased and be because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but David carried aside into the house of obed Edom the Gittite. Let's pause there again one more time. This man, Obed Edom, is very interesting because I have always thought that he was a Jew. Chances are he was not. If he is a Gittite, he's at least related to the Philistines. He's probably converted to Judaism, but it's possible this man was a Gentile. And formerly a Philistine, but he had now converted to Judaism. And my God, he had discovered 
the importance and the value of God's presence. I want to submit to you that the thing, one thing that made Obed-Edom stand out from all these different characters in this drama was his high preference and value and love for the presence of God. I believe it was a fact that was well known by those who knew him or those who were his neighbors. They noticed how devoted he was to the God of the Jews. And when David is stuck, there is a corpse there. The ark is stuck. He says, I can't proceed to Jerusalem. More people are going to die. He was even afraid himself. The Bible says, the man, the great psalmist, the prophet, is afraid. And I'm sure all the people, including his soldiers, were afraid. And they could not proceed any farther. But notice, the ark got stuck just a few meters from the house of Obed-Edom. That is not a coincidence. God is trying to teach us something extremely important this morning. Valuing, hosting, containing the presence of God in our families. It's not enough for us to come in God's presence in this great house. I love it. But God wants to live with us in our homes. God wants to become a God of households. God wants to become a present and real present God present in our homes. He wants to live with us as families. So what happened was that David says, he said, hey, David, there is a devoted man here. He's not a Jew, but he can keep the box. He'll keep the ark. So, David says to him, here, can you receive this and keep it? Now, follow, follow. If you are Obed-Edom, and you look through the window, and God had killed somebody on spot, a young man is dead in the ground, you can see him, and the cause of his death, touching the Ark of the Covenant. And someone says, Open the door. Yes, my king. Put the ark in your house. How would you behave it was you? How, <laughs> how would you respond? The, the cause of death is being brought into your house. <laughs> and, and, and I'm sure even Obed Edom's wife may have been apprehensive. But now get it. So it was an awkward moment. How Obed Edom will respond to receive an ark with a corpse lying next to it. And moreover, David did not specify how long the ark would stay in his home. It may have been indefinite. And it's possible his children who were young could come and accidentally touch it. There will be more dead bodies in his house. Now, I, I, I sometimes, you know, I imagine, I imagine in my mind that David could not have brought that ark in that man's house as a trap to kill his children. I believe, I don't have the proof, but I, I, like I said, God has given us the power to imagine. I suspect David and the neighbors had heard about this man. If there was anyone who could receive, contain, and keep the Ark of the Covenant, it was Obed-Edom. So he says, can you keep it? He says, yes, I'll keep it. I'll keep it. Obed-Edom loved God's presence more than he loved his own life. He was willing to risk his life by keeping the Ark of the Covenant in his house. That is how much he loved God's presence. Hallelujah. The man 
is an amazing character. And to prove this, when finally, oh, let's read the, let's read the rest of the verses. It says, uh, verse 11, and the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. The presence of God comes in our homes. God wants to live with us. God is a God of households. He's the God of the Wantates. The God of the Mohindos. He wants to come and live with us in our homes. And when he comes, something unique happens. In three months, just three months, there was a remarkable difference in the home of Obed-Edom. It was so vivid and so, so significant that the neighbors rushed and told David Banange, come and see what has happened to this man. Look at his home. The blessing of God permeated, saturated, filled, affected everything connected to him. Everything. From the chickens, the cows, the sheep, the children, his wife, his businesses, his health. Everything was affected by that blessing. It was tangible. You could see it. It was remarkable. It was amazing. It was something that everybody said, oh, what has happened to this man? Look at him. It was so significant that people, I think, even became jealous. They ran, told David, it's not fair that one person gets all this blessing. Look what God has done in this man's life. When David came, he confirmed what they said. And of course, as we know, uh, in verse 12, it was told King David saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertains unto him because, because of the ark of God, because of the presence of God in his home. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom in the city of David with gladness. God is teaching us a valuable lesson that those who host, who invite, who contain his presence in their homes, their homes can never remain the same. Impossible. Can't remain the same. God wants to become the God of your family. He wants to live with you in your house. Now, to prove my submission, this man loved God more than he loved anything else. In 1 Chronicles chapter 16, 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 37, it says, And so he left there before the ark of the covenant of the Lord Asaph and his brethren to minister before the ark continually as every day's work required. And Obed-Edom with their brethren, three score and eight, Obed-Edom also the son of Jeduthun, Hosa to be porters, and Zadok the priest and his brethren, the priests before the tabernacle of the Lord in the high place that was in Gibeon. Now, think with me for a moment. This man had probably had become very wealthy. God had blessed them. He had money. He had success. His children were doing well in school. They were prosperous. They were comfortable. They probably expanded their house. They, like, their business blossomed. They, 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 their enemies were, couldn't stand before them. The powers of darkness were pushed back in their lives. They were victorious. They were, they were doing well. Now, when David takes the ark from their house and transports it into Jerusalem and puts it in the tabernacle of David, guess what happens? Obed Edom tells his family, pack your bags. We're following the ark of the covenant. He follows the ark 
to Jerusalem and he becomes a gatekeeper. The man who had tremendous blessing in his home, he could have cast on that blessing and lived off it. But this man found a secret. It's not enough having blessings if you don't have the blesser. He knew, he knew if he kept in the presence of God, blessings are inevitable. He followed it. And he became a gatekeeper. That's where David gets that psalm. In Psalms 84, David observed the life of this man and he wrote a psalm, Psalms 84, verse 10. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. It's because David saw that in open Edom. Hallelujah. And it did not stop there. The blessing continued. I'm going to show it to you. Don't think this man lost by leaving his estate or selling it off and becoming a doorkeeper <laughs> in the house of God. He didn't lose a thing because the blessing of God continued upon his life. Oh, hallelujah. That's why I believe this man loved God's presence more than anything else. He loved God's presence more than his own life. He was willing to risk his family by having the Ark of the Covenant in his home. Just because he wanted to be near God. And for him, even if it was just to open the door and peek, you know, he's not a Jew, but if he could just peek and see what's going on, for him, that, that was heaven on earth. Just let me be a gatekeeper and be near, near his presence. To me, that's more than, than anything else I can own out there in the world. This man is amazing. Indeed, he's, he, he's an amazing man. Now, <laughs> oh, Lord God of heaven. You know, the presence of God is something that I'm, I'm, these days I'm taking more time to meditate upon. The Bible says in the book of Exodus 33 verse 11. Exodus 33 verse 11 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaks unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. The people who appreciate and dwell in the presence of God are unique people. Indeed, they are. The Bible speaks of Moses coming repeatedly in the presence of God. When he would come, sometimes his face would change, they would, to shine, to radiate. There would be a glow coming out of his face because he is basking in the presence of God. The Bible says God spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks with a friend. Now observe, often Moses would go with his assistant. And as Moses got close enough to the presence of God, Joshua kept his distance behind him. But when Moses would spend a week, a day, two days, when he would leave, Joshua would abide in his presence. No wonder Joshua became the heir to Moses. No wonder Joshua one time told the son, stand, stay where you are, don't move. And the son obeyed him. No wonder Joshua one time told the, the, the he, he, he helped Israel cross the river Jordan. Just as Moses helped Israel cross the Red Sea. The people who dwell in the presence of God are unique people. Something happens to them. Hallelujah. It also is, it is something that cascades everything you own, your children. Let me show this to you in the life of Obed-Edom. 
In the book of 1 Chronicles 26, let me give you some scripture to back up what I'm saying. 1 Chronicles 26, verse 4. Moreover, the sons of Obed-Edom were Shemaiah, the firstborn, Jehozabad, the second, Joha, the third, Zakah, the fourth, Nathanael, the fifth, Emil, the sixth, Issachar, the seventh, Peluthiah, the eighth, for God blessed him. Hallelujah. For God blessed him. Listen, the time he was even a doorkeeper in the house of God, God continued to bless him. The man was fruitful. He had children, and not just ordinary children. Look how this young man turned out in verse 6. Also unto Shemaiah his son were sons born that ruled throughout the house of their father. For they were mighty men of valor. These were not just taka taka kwara kwara. These were mighty men of valor. These were extraordinary men. The blessing of God cascaded. It spread even to his grandchildren. The scripture says in verse 7, the sons of Shemaiah, Othenai, Raphael, and Obed, Elizabeth, whose brethren were strong men. Hallelujah. Hear me, church. If you'll have the prince of God in your families, if you allow your children to bask, to abide, to grow up in the presence of God, your children will be extraordinary. Your children are going to reap. You cannot abide in God's presence and remain the same. It's impossible. It's impossible. If we have a regular altars and prayer and worship in our families, if our children are introduced and they abide in the presence of God, something will happen to them. Something will happen to them. The scripture says, look, verse 8. <laughs> All these of the sons of Obed-Edom, they and their sons and their brethren, able men for strength for the service, were three and two, three score and two of Obed-Edom. I mean, talk about mental capacity. Talk about physical health. Talk about being socially balanced. Talk about favor. Talk about being fruitful. Talk about making waves, being, ah, being people of influence. You mention anything. If our children can be allowed to grow up in a home where there is the presence of God, like sunlight, they bask and grow in it, they will never be ordinary people. Our children will turn out to be extraordinary. Our children, don't be surprised if your children, your son, is one of the best three in PLE in the whole country. I'm telling you. <laughs> you know, I don't like talking about myself. Sometimes you come off as if you're bragging. I, I don't like that. But to make a point, sometimes I'm forced to. My daughter, Joshi, went to Green Hill. And when she was, I think, in P4, I forget what it was. One of the teachers in that class made a very bad remark about my daughter. He told her, you are... You're stupid. You, 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 you don't have enough intelligence. And he told her that you're dumb. Now, when I went to pick her up in the evening, I found her crying. She says, Daddy, the teacher said I'm stupid. He said I'm, I'm dumb. I mean, I, I don't have the brains. Now, you know I'm saved. You know that I'm saved. 
I'm saved. So I really had to contain myself. And I said, if I go and talk with this man now, I might do things that are not Christian. So I did not go to him. I said to her, let's go get in the car, let's go home. But we had the tradition, and the best of our but we still try to do it. We have an altar. We spend time singing and worshiping in our home. And you know, it's amazing. Every one of our children, some of them are here. When they do major exams, they are among the best, not just in their schools, but in the nation. I'm saying, if we will understand the benefits and the importance of inviting, hosting, containing the presence of God in our families, it will change our lives. It affects everything we have. People spend bills and bills and a lot of money every time they go to hospital, go to hospital, treatment, treatment, this child. Sometimes the treatment is very simple. Invite the parents of God in your home. Invite the parents of God in your home. The more of God's presence is evident in your home, the more the powers of darkness are pushed out and farther away from your families. You don't need a prophet. You don't need an apostle. Just invite the presence of God in your families. Look at, look at this man's family. Every, in fact, the blessing did not just end with his own children. The blessing began to affect even the grandchildren. Grandchildren. Hallelujah. I was in Rushere, Nyabushoji. That part of the country is a very interesting part of Uganda. Because during the revival in the Anglican church, that place was transformed. People abandoned the worship of Bachwezi and all these spirits and they embrace Christ. And they changed how they named their children. Most names there, and I, I respect that, their names connected to God. And as I drove the car for tens and tens of miles, you will not see a single shrine. No shrine. Now, I can't say that in Buganda. I, Buganda... <laughs> We need prayers. <laughs> but in some parts of our calling, you drive and drive, you don't see a shrine. You only see churches. And I'm not surprised that the children of some of those revivalists, some of those people who embrace the gospel, their grandchildren are among the shakers and movers in the country today. If you look at the people who are in senior leadership in the army, in many places, many of them, either their parents or grandparents, embraced the gospel and they were part of that revival. What I'm talking about is not Wolokoso, it is, it is, it is reality. When we embrace the presence of God in our families, it will transform the caliber, the nature, the type of children and homes we have. It will change them. It will change them. Praise the Lord. Now, I want to share with you two things that make this man very unique. Then we're going to pray. This man invited God into his family. Julius, come here with me. Come. Come.
David told Obed-Edom, Obed-Edom, I am stuck. Will you please receive the Ark of the Covenant and keep it with you? I don't know for how long, but just keep it. And when time is right, I'll come and, and take it away from you. And this man, amazingly, others would have said, ah, we're going to consider. No, 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 no. Take it. This man said, I will receive the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant represents the presence and glory of God. So in a sense, Obed-Edom took God in his home. Now, a home is a private part of our lives. Our homes, there are rooms that only me and Sabrina, in our bedroom, there's privacy in our homes. But when you take God in your home, it means you're allowing him to be part of your family. Two things are going to happen. It means now, because God lives with you, you be careful what you say and what you do. If we are going to invite and host the presence of God, there is a price to pay. It means we will adjust our routine. It means we shall watch less television because God is in the house. It means you be careful what you watch, what you read. Why? Because God is in the house. I imagine in my mind that Obed-Edom told his children, Bananga, please be careful how you talk. Don't mess around. Why? Because God is in the house. Please don't, 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 don't cause me grief. When one of you dies, be careful how you behave because God is in the house. His presence changed their lifestyle. It changed their schedule. It changed they had to have time to sit around and worship because God inhabits the praises of his people. God loves worship. God loves praise. And this man made sure there was praise and worship in his house so that they could contain, they could handle, they could treasure the presence of God. It changed their schedule. They could no longer just spend all the time watching TV. I'm just giving, I'm giving an example. It changed their routine. And I want to ask, how many people are here who are willing to invite the presence of God in their homes and pay the price? How many? Thank you. And those who don't put up their hands also thank you. You're being honest. Because there's a price. There is a price. I, I, I can see. Where are you? Stay here. I can imagine in my mind, open Edom instructing his children now, you know, when we are the people of God, when we have God in the house, be careful who you debt. Be careful how you go out. Be careful. I, I can see him instructing his children to walk circumspectly before God. I see Obed Edom teaching the word of God, reminding his children how God expects us to live. I see Obed Edom making sure that people are careful what they say to one another. I can see him making sure that there's time for everyone to come and worship, even those who are just visiting, even those who are relatives, but to stay in his home. I can see him taking effort to mobilize them, to honor and respect God. And that's how the man was able to contain and hold the presence of God. I want to ask a question. Are you prepared to do that? Are you? Are you? It means even those who come to visit your sister, your niece, the housemaid, they are all now living in a house where God dwells. That means all of us must be careful. We must be God conscious. 
And we must have time to come and worship and praise and, you know, and spend time in his presence. There is that price that must be paid. Now, something else too. Because God was in the house, Obed-Edom could not be one thing in his home and another in public. What he was in the home is what he was in the public. Why? Because God was living with him. People who contain and receive the presence of God, they are not living double lives. What they are in their homes is what they are in public. You cannot beat your wife in your home and mistreat her and come and serve as an usher in Makaya for Gospel Church. You cannot swear and curse and say obscene things and then come to church and lead worship. Uh -uh. That's living a double life. The moment Obed Edom allowed the ark to come in his house and was hosting God's presence, he had to be straight as an arrow. Are you prepared for that? Are you prepared for that? It means what you are at home is what you are in public because God lives with you. You can no longer deceive your conscience. You're aware he's with you in your home. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. As I finish, in second, first Chronicles 16, first Chronicles 16, verse 4 and 6 to 6, first Chronicles 16, verse 4 to 6 says, and he appointed certain of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord and to record and to thank and praise the Lord God of Israel. As of the chief and next to him, Zechariah, Jael, Sherim Ramoth, Jael, and Mattathiah, and Eliab, and Beniah, and again Obed Edom, and Jael with the satyrs and with harps, but Asaph made a sound with cymbals. Listen, Benaiah also and Jehaziel, the priests with trumpets, continually before the covenant of God. The last thing I want to talk about that is a special trait in Obed Edom was his love for music worship and praise in his life i believe it's because when the ark was in his house when the ark of god was still in his house because god dwells in praises he continually regularly would have times of worship and praise in his family I'm emphasizing praise and worship for a purpose. It was not just prayer, but there was music. And David came to know that's one of the ways Obed Edom was able to contain and keep the ark. Because God loves worship. So when he took the ark to Jerusalem, he asked Obed Edom to join a team of other musicians. And the Bible tells us there 24 7, every day of the week, there was constant music and worship around the Ark of the Covenant. And what God was doing in the family of Obed Edom is what God began to do for the entire nation. During the reign of David, the blessing of 
regard on the kingdom was outstanding. David stretched the borders of Israel to the extreme end. David established a strong kingdom. David prospered. There was a peace. He defeated all his enemies. What he was doing in the home of one man. Now because the ark is, is placed in the capital. And is now serving the entire nation. David made sure there was worship and praise continually. Continually. And because of that, just as he blessed one family, he blessed the entire nation. David saw that first in the life of Obed Edom. There are many things David learned about that man. How to contain and keep the presence of God so that he can be a blessing, not a burden or a curse. How God can, you know, God is good, as Pastor Obed says. God is good. He's good. He's very good if you know how to handle him. The presence of God is a medicinal. The presence of God in your family is, it will re revolutionize your home. It, it, is, it will never leave a family the same. Never. But just as he blessed one family, the same thing was being done for the entire nation. So, as I finish, if we want to invite the presence of God in our families, let us take time and sing and Worship the Lord in our families. I know you don't, have, you don't sing that word. That, that, that doesn't matter. Uh, God gave you that voice. Just use that, whatever you have, and sing to him. Hmm? If you sing in key X, key Y, just, don't, just use, use that. What God cares most is your heart. But that constant worship and praise and singing and, and adoration to God there's a way it, it draws him and, and he comes in your home and he begins to heal and touch and change and prosper, break barriers, push back powers of darkness, heal, make you fruitful, prosper, prolong your life. The blessings are numerous. They're numerous. That's what happened in the family of Obed-Edom. In three months, the man was totally different. And the same thing that was being done in one house now was being done in the entire kingdom. So as I finish, can we yearn for his presence? Can we invite his presence? Can we endeavor to keep it? Dignify it, give it its due honor and respect and continually gather as sons and daughters grandchildren, whatever it is, to worship the Lord and make him feel at home. Make him feel that he's appreciated. And when he comes, I guarantee you, your family will never, never, never remain the same. It's impossible. It's impossible. It's impossible. Hallelujah. Let us stand to our feet and sing a song together. In your presence, that's where I am strong. In your presence, oh Lord my God. In your presence, that's where I belong. Seeking your faith. Touching your grace in the cleft of the rock. In your presence, oh God. In your presence, in your presence. That's where I am strong. In your presence.
touching your grace. Touching your grace. In the cleft of the rock. In the cleft of the rock. In your presence, oh God. In your presence, oh God. Make this your prayer. In your presence. In your presence. That's where. That's where I. being fruitless one of the chores is the presence of God ah. there are things that God will do at his own pace but he will do it he works mysteriously if your children can't sleep at night they have bad dreams if you can't sleep at night, you feel your house is haunted. You have those spiritual attacks. One of the chores is the presence of God. You don't have to abandon that house. You don't have to leave that village. Just invite the presence of God in your home. So. You know, the, I always talk about someone who goes to a zoo and he goes with a dog. And the dog comes to the cage where there's a lion. And the dog begins to bark. Bah, 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 bah. And say, Bambi, the lion. Look at this. This dog is disturbing the lion. Bambi, the lion is being harassed. No, don't feel sorry for the lion. Just open the cage. <laughs> open the cage <laughs> lion will take care of itself if there are dogs back <laughs> if there are dogs harassing you open the cage yeah. Yeah. hallelujah yeah. let the lion of the tribe of Judah roar yeah. hey my friend they know him you may not know him, but they know him. Ah, oh, yeah. They know him. Invite the presence of God in your home. Make him feel comfortable. Make him feel comfortable. Let him abide with you. Your life will be transformed. In your presence, that's where I am strong. In your presence, oh Lord, my God. In your presence, that's where I belong. Seeking your faith, touching your grace. In the cleft of the rock, in the cleft of the rock. One more time in your presence. In your presence. Oh, 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 oh my God.
take some time and talk to God in your own words father God this morning we want to seek your presence we want to have your presence in our homes we want to invite in our homes father come and live with us come and dwell with us give us your presence in our homes in our families with our children with our children father as we walk and our grandchildren give us your presence give us your glory give us your power father walk with us stretch your hand and let's sign the wonders be done oh god defend and heal and deliver heal and deliver us oh god give us your presence and your glory give us your power son of god we need you lord god almighty we need you son of god the king of israel we need you father god of mercy be with us oh lord oh god one I want to hide where the blazing fire cannot touch me where I'm gathered on the road I want to hide where the blazing fire cannot burn me in your presence oh presence in your presence yeah. that's where I am strong my Lord in, in your, your presence. presence my Lord in your presence God, a clap of for him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated.